folks, welcome to the Seven Figure Network Podcast. My name is Melford Bivens, and today I am so pleased to be joined by Bob Berg. Bob is one of my favorite authors. I mean, this is just one of those things where I read Go Giver years ago. I love it. And you guys know that one of the most important aspects of us in teaching you is how to roll your products out to businesses, how to bring a real level of professionalism to network marketing without losing the heart, without losing the soul. So still able to grow, still able to work with our one-to-many model, but not losing what made you want to do this in the first place. So first and foremost, Bob, thanks so much for being on today. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure, Melford. Thank you for having me. So, so Bob, do me a favor. And I know you've probably been asked this question a million times, but I got to ask it. What was the real origin of Go-Giver? What was that What was that kernel, that little spark in your mind that drove you and John to, to write this book in the first place? Well, early on in, uh, in my speaking career, my first book was actually called Endless Referrals, and the subtitle was Networker, Everyday Contacts of the Sales. And it was really, it was a, a, a system for entrepreneurs and salespeople who knew they had a great product or service. They were proud of it. They knew it brought wonderful value to people, but they didn't necessarily feel comfortable excuse me, with the idea of going out into the local communities and, mm. and building the kinds of relationships that would cause people to want to do business with them directly and or refer them to others. So Endless Referrals was that system. Uh, I, I personally define a system as the process of predictably achieving a goal based on a logical and specific set of how to principles, the key being predictability. If it's been proven that by doing A, you'll get the desired results of B, then you know all you need to do is A and continue to do A. And eventually you'll get the desired results of B. That's what endless referrals was. And then the the premise was that all things being equal, people will do business with and refer business to those people they know, like, and trust, which has kind of been my calling card for 30 odd years. So so that's really what it was about. That was the how-to system. However, I'd always enjoyed reading business parables since I'd been in sales. Um, I think parables, which are stories, I think they connect on a deeper level and a heart-to-heart level. And and I thought, what if we could take the the basic no like and trust premise and put that into a you know a story and you know, coming up with the title was pretty easy because it's just a matter of asking what is the what's the basic essence of those entrepreneurs and salespeople who are able to both quickly and sustainably create those no like and trust relationships. And it really comes down to their givers. They're always looking to give value to others, to to make people's lives better, to help others to achieve. And that's how they achieve. Mm-hmm. And so I, I asked John David Mann, who was the editor in chief of a, a magazine I used to write for, uh, if he would consider uh, being the the co-author and really the lead writer and storyteller. I'm more of a how-to person. John is an absolutely brilliant, magnificent writer and also an entrepreneur. And uh, and uh, so he said, fortunately for me, he said yes. <laughs> and uh, we collaborated on it. And that's really how how the go-giver uh, you know, came about. Yeah. Now, you, you mentioned something that is that's so prevalent in this market. And a lot of folks try and bypass the know and like part and just jump right to the trust. And, and I think that's that's one of the, you know, I hate to re- use the word failing, but one of the failings I feel in this industry is because we're based on, you know, meeting people for the first time, you know, really trying to, you know, w- w- wow them with our product, wow them with everything else. I think that they really sort of get past that know and like part and just instantly think that people should try and trust them. So mm. thinking about this industry, how, what, what can you advise for these folks, for these network marketers and, and talking to folks that are a little along the journey. So, you know, my audience is typically not the first day folks. You know, they've been in the industry for a little bit. Uh, They might be a little frustrated, feeling a little stuck, looking for a new way of doing things because again, the word system you used might not be there as powerfully as it should be to get them past that sticking point. So what would you say would be the best way for folks like that to to really get no and like to be the massive part because trust kind of comes along afterwards, right? Well, I mean, yeah, the the, the three truly work together. They have to obviously either know you or know who you are in order to be able to do business with you. So if it's a matter of you meeting them, uh, you know, having met somewhere, whether it's an outbound or whether you've met them at an event or, or whether you've, you know, however you, you would meet someone uh, or a referral. And I, you know, I love, I love referrals because um, I see four major benefits in referred prospects. One is it's simply easier to set the appointment, right? You're going in on borrowed trust. So mm-hmm. instead of all the prospecting that you have to do in order to make that happen, you go in on, on that, that borrowed trust. Um, with a referred prospect, 
price is usually less of an issue. Uh, that doesn't mean it's a non-issue or not an issue, but the price of your products typically, uh, you know, because you go in again on borrowed influence and some borrowed, borrowed trust, you come in already with credibility and thus you can sell on high value rather than low price. When you, you know, when you sell on price, you're a commodity. When you sell on high value, you're a resource. Uh, the, uh, the, the third real benefit of a referred prospect is simply easier to complete the sale, if you want to call it the connection, whatever, however you want to call it, because of, again, this is, this is straight borrowed trust. Um, this is, this is really what we call vicarious experience. In other words, that, no, this person may not have known you previously, but someone who they know, like, and trust has said, oh yeah, this is the person you want to see. They have a wonderful product or service. They're fantastic at what they do. They're very knowledgeable. They have your best interest at heart, right? You know, you can't beat that kind of right. referral, that kind of credibility. And then the fourth benefit of a referred prospect is that with referred prospects, they're already of the mindset that that's how you do business because that's how they met you. So in their world, in their, in their paradigm, if you will, they see you as a professional who meets their prospects through referral, sells on high value rather than low price, completes the transaction, and uh, then is referred to to others. So, so I think you know that's real. So, if you meet someone through referral, you've you're obviously nine steps ahead of the game in a ten step game. Yeah. But the key to that, you know, the know and like, sure they know you. Likeability is very important. Um, you know, it's not the end all be all. Theoretically, someone could do business with you without liking you, but it's not very likely. I mean, they, they you know, and I, you know what I'm saying. And and uh, unless you're the only game in town, which you're probably not and have the only product in town, which you probably don't. And I know yours is the best, whatever it is you sell, yours is the best. <laughs> yeah. But but that's something you know, that's not something they know yet. And, and you know, what they want to first know is, is this person a credible person? Do I, you know, I know them, do I like them? And do I trust them? Do I trust them in terms of what Stephen M. R. Covey in his great book, uh, The Speed of Trust, as he says, you know, there's two types of trust. There's con competence and character. Mm -hmm. Do I trust that they know what they're doing, that they, you know, that they have that competence, that mastery of their, their product service business? And do I trust their character? Mm -hmm. And so I, I think we have to believe and remember that it always begins there. Yeah. And, and then the product comes into play. Yeah, that's great. You, you mentioned two things there, and I, and I was furiously scribbling notes as always. People know I, I use a pen because a pen I'm old. So I was furiously <laughs> scribbling down my notes. And you mentioned two things that really got me, you know, borrowed trust. That, that is such a powerful idea that I don't think many people talk about because they think that borrowed trust is like, you know, working with an influencer or something like that, where it often can be just somebody that you know. So could you go into what are the ways that you can actually borrow trust from somebody? Well, the way you do that is by first earning their trust mm. and and then they're being willing to to introduce you to uh, to others. And so the way we can lead into that, there's there's many different ways, but we need to be willing to ask for that referral. And and, you know, what I like to do if someone is is not feeling comfortable yet in the referral asking process is to begin with what I call the referral bridge. Um a bridge in the physical world is a structure that transports a person from one safe piece of land to another. In the, excuse me, referral world, a bridge is a phrase that does the same thing. It takes you from one safe piece of land, the no like and trust relationship mm -hmm. to another safe piece of land where you can ask for referrals in such a way that you are comfortable with it and your now referral source mm -hmm. is comfortable with it. So let's say you're talking to one of your clients and they know, like, and trust you. They've had a great product experience. You know, they love the product and so forth. So the referral bridge might sound something like, you know, Dave, well, um, most of my business now is through referrals and introductions. Uh, you know, I find it's it's helpful to partner with my clients and friends such as you. Can we take a few quick minutes and run past the names of some other people? I might also be able to help. Oh, great. Now, if if right now most of your new business is not through referrals and you don't feel comfortable saying that because you don't want to say something that's not true, you could say, you know, Dave, as I'm expanding my referral business, 
I find it's helpful to partner with because now you're just saying as you're uh, expanding your referral business, which you are, and soon you will have a lot of referrals if you use this this part of the system. And then you can say as as much of, as most of my new business now is through referrals and introductions, I find it's helpful to partner with. And so, so you know, the first part of that, you're you're kind of cluing them into what you're going to be asking, that you're going to be asking for referrals. When you say, I find it's helpful to partner with my clients and friends such as you, mm -hmm. uh, that partner is a key word right there because you're giving that person buy-in. You're giving them ownership into your mission. And again, they're not necessarily just referring you for your sake, but because they realize that what you have can help a lot of people. Yeah. So uh, then when you say, uh, can we take a few quick minutes and run past the names of some other people? You're using what I call fast language or quick language. You're not saying it quickly, but by the the words you're using, you're implying that you're not going to take up a lot of their time. Uh, listen to these quick words. Can we take a few quick minutes and run past? Mm. Okay, and then the names of some other people. I might also be able to help. Now, notice I said might. Now, why? Don't I believe in my product or service? Sure. But we also want to let them know that we understand that not everybody's going to be interested. And that's okay. So we always want to imply the out or back door, which is an emotional escape route so that no one ever feels as though they're you know, they're cornered in or that they, you know, and, and this is very important. You know, what I call Berg's law of the out or back door is, is that the bigger the outer back door you give someone to take, the less they'll feel the need to take. Oh, it. Great. Right. So, yeah. And so, um, so, you know, you have their buy-in uh, and so forth. And now you, uh, you want to go to the asking part. Now here's where a lot of, of people kind of, use some words that are counterproductive. And I can speak firsthand because I did the same thing when I began in sales. And then I, I read a great book about 40 years ago called How to Master the Art of Selling by Tom Hopkins. And in on one page, it took about half a page to explain this. And it was absolute pure brilliance. So I want to give credit where it's where it's owed, where it's due. And so what what Tom said is, you know, when you when you ask, hey, do you know anyone who or who do you know who might be interested? Since most people know 250, 300 people, when we use those words, you know, who do you know? Do you know a collage of, of hundreds of people go past their head? They can't really identify anyone. And then they say, well, and, you know, as they're trying hard, they don't want to let you down. And the memory shuts down because. They can't think of anyone. And finally they go, what? They go, well, I can't think of anybody right now, but when I do, I'll call you or, or let you know. So um, what, what Tom suggested was to gently funnel down their world into small groups of people they can easily see. Mm -hmm. So let's say you're, 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 speaking with someone uh, and her name is uh, Ann Jones. Okay. And you say, Ann, you know, I know you're a, an avid golfer because you've gotten to know her. Right. And, and, and she says, Oh yeah, I'm out there every Sunday afternoon playing, you know, Oh, do you play with different people all the time or the same? Oh no. Same foursome for years, Harry Brown, Michael cloud, Dr. Mary Ruart, the four of us, we have been golfing buddies for years. Well, boom, she's just now named four pe three people that she can see in her mind's eye. So now you'd say, hmm, uh, do you feel that Harry or Michael or Dr. Mary, or however you would say it based on your, you know, might, would be interested and might like to hear from me would be, you know, however, uh, and it may be none of them, maybe all of them, maybe one of them, but it doesn't matter. Um, the key is that you created the environment for her to be victorious, to be able to come up with names and feel comfortable in the process. And that's what's so, so very, very important. Yes. So now you go on to another one. You know that Anne is a, a member of her local uh, business professional women's uh, local chapter, BPW. Now you don't say, is there anyone in your BPW chapter? Because again, anyone, it could be too big a, a chapter. So you say, uh, Anne, is there anyone in your chapter with whom you're particularly good friends uh, or you sit next to every time or serve on a committee with maybe. Now, again, you're giving her a small 
group of people. So she thinks of two people, maybe yes, maybe no, maybe whatever. Uh, you also know she's the chair of the board of directors or directors of her local animal shelter. Mm -hmm. So you ask how many people serve on the board with her? Well, there's five. Well, that's a pretty good number. So you can work with that and you kind of say, and picture, you know, those five people individually, if you would, which do you feel, if any, again, you want to give the outer back to her, which, if any, do you feel might be open to, you know, what have you. So yes. what you're doing is you're really presenting these various uh, frames from which she can very easily successfully come up with names yeah. and then going from there. You know, that, that's so beautiful. And I, I love the way that you've made it so a, you make them picture in their mind a person. It, it's so powerful. And a lot of folks don't think that because a lot of folks don't, you know, some folks think in words, some folks think in pictures, but even if you take a word person and you say a name in picture, they really get a nice defined person there. And exactly. B, making them look like a hero for giving the referral. I swear, it just drives me crazy when people ask other people to give them referrals and they're acting like they're doing a, a favor. You know, right. the, the, the referrer is doing the favor to the person they're referring. They're, they, right. you know, if they're a good person, they're not referring the wrong people. I, I right. love that so much. Thank you. And the referral bridge, fantastic. Thanks for giving. Thank you for giving scripting because you know that the folks in this audience are just looking for ways to get in. And as you know, we work mostly B2B. So it's, it's you know, adds that little extra layer of challenge to do this in front of a business owner than it does for a normal exactly. person. So that's great. Hey, my, okay, it's, it's going to sound funny, but my favorite book is Adversaries into Allies. I absolutely Thank you. love that book. And Thank I think you. that not nearly enough people have read it. So do me a favor and talk about that. Because that, to me, that's one of the most important things you can do is taking these adversarial, you know, engagements and turning it into a friendship model. So can you explain that book a little bit for folks who haven't read it? Yeah, I mean, it's basically people skills, you know, is, is what it is. And I'm a big believer that people skills are the differentiator between the relatively successful person, even the very successful person, mm -hmm. and that person who attains that enormous level, that stratospheric level yeah. uh, of success. Uh, you know, it's what I call genuine influence, mm -hmm. uh, which I define as the ability to deal with people in such a way that you get the results you want mm -hmm. while helping them to feel genuinely good about themselves, about the situation and about you. So taking the five laws of stratospheric success, how would you apply those to this market? Because again, we're looking at network marketers who have been in the industry for a little bit, probably hit a couple of stumbling stones, might have stubbed a toe here or there, really don't know their next direction. I know that your five laws truly define a path for these folks. So can you walk the folks through a path of how you can go from that real stuck, you know, I'm, I'm ready to turn it in, ready to take off the hat and throw it out. I don't want to be in this company anymore to using your five laws to getting back in the game and then using your strategies to actually start building again. So. The five laws center around a basic premise, and that is that shifting your focus, and this is really the key, shifting your focus from getting to giving. And when we say giving in this context, we simply mean constantly and consistently providing immense value to others, understanding that doing so is not only a more pleasant way of conducting business, it's the most financially profitable way as well. Uh, not for any woo-woo way out there, magical, mystical type of reasons. It actually makes very logical, very rational sense. When you are that person who can move your focus off of yourself and place it on serving others, on discovering what they need, what they want, what they desire, when you can take your focus off yourself and place it on helping other people solve their problems, uh, when you can move from a, a self-focus to a focus on well, helping to bring them closer to happiness. Mm -hmm. uh, people feel good about you. People want to get to know you. They want to be in relationship with you. They, they begin to know, like, and trust you. They want to do business with you. They want to refer and recommend you to others. So that's really you know, where it begins, the five laws, which are the laws of value, compensation, influence, authenticity, and receptivity. This is where we now holistically take this and, and are able to apply that. So when you look at value, the law of value says that your true worth is determined by how much more you give in value than you take in payment. Now, what's important to, to know here, because when you first hear that, it's sort of counterintuitive, give more in value than I take in payment, sounds like a recipe for bankruptcy, right? So we have to understand the difference between price and value. Uh, price is a dollar figure, it's a dollar amount, it's finite, it simply is what it is. Value, on the other hand, is the 
relative worth or desirability of a thing, of something to the end user or beholder. In other words, what is it about this thing, this product, service, concept, idea, what have you, that brings so much worth to another person that they um, that they willingly exchange their money for it and they're ecstatic that they did while you make a very healthy uh, profit. So let's say you have a product that you are making available and, you know, you can think of, uh, we'll keep it very generic here. So you just think of the benefits that your product provides. Mm -hmm. the, the, the chances are it provides much more in value to them than what they're paying. But of course you also make a very healthy profit because it costs you less to, um, you know, to, uh, to sell it than what you're paying for it yourself. So, so, you know, in any market-based uh, transaction, if you will, there should always be two profits, the buyer profits and the seller profits, because each of them come away better off afterwards than they were beforehand. No. But in answer, in direct answer to your question, okay, you've got to make sure to see it's up to you to, to be the person who communicates that value, who places their interests first, who absolutely is, creates such a, a magnificent buying experience that aside from the intrinsic value of your product or, itself, that the entire experience for them is magnificent. And you do this through your excellence, your consistency, your attention, your empathy, and your appreciation. Mm -hmm. And to the degree that you that you keep those five, what we call elements of value um, in mind, that's the degree that you, you know, again, are able to ingratiate yourself and have this person see you as a value-based resource. So that's really the law of, of value. It starts with a focus on them. You know, this is why John David Mann and I say that money is simply an echo of value, right? It's the thunder, if you will, to values lightning, which means the value is the focus. The value comes first. The money you receive is simply a natural result of the value you've provided. Law number two, the law of compensation says your income is determined by how many people you serve and how well you serve them. So where law number one says to give more in value than you take in payment, law number two tells us the more people whose lives you touch with the exceptional value you provide, the more money with which you'll receive. Now, of course, the network marketing model is perfect for that because you can actually impact so many people's lives, both directly and, and indirectly. Uh, law number three, the law of influence says your influence is determined by how abundantly you place other people's interests first. Now, uh, please understand, we're not saying you should be, when we say other people's interests first, we're not saying you should be a doormat or a martyr or self-sacrificial in any way. No, it's just understanding as Joe, the protege in the story, learned from several of the mentors and what we talked about earlier, the golden rule of business says all things being equal, people will do business with and refer business to those people they know, like, and trust. Well, here's the thing. There's no faster, more powerful, or more effective way to elicit those feelings toward you from others than by genuinely moving from an I focus or me focus to an other focus. Looking to, as, as Sam, one of the mentors advised Joe, make your win all about the other person's win. Yes. Law number four, the law of authenticity says the most valuable gift you have to offer is yourself. Well, this really says nothing more than that all the skills in the world, the sales skills, technical skills, even people skills, as important as they are, and they are all indeed very important. Um, they're also all for naught if you don't come at it from your true authentic core. Hmm. But when you do, when you show up as yourself day after day, week after week, month after month, well, people feel good about you. They feel comfortable with you. They feel safe mm. with you. And that's where that trust really can take hold and really grow. Law number five, the law of receptivity says the key to effective giving is to stay open to receiving. This really means that, you know, that it's understanding that, yeah, you breathe out, you also have to breathe in. Right. You breathe out carbon dioxide, you breathe in oxygen, you breathe out, which is giving, you breathe in, which is receiving. Despite the horrible anti-prosperity messages that the world around us, you know, tries to feed us all the time. Fact is, giving and receiving are not opposite concepts. They're simply two sides of the very same coin and they work in tandem. It's not, are you a giver or a receiver? You're a giver and 
a receiver. But what you know is that the given comes first. This is universal law. It's laws of human nature. It's laws of physical nature. We, uh, you plant before you harvest. You sow before you reap. You give value before you receive. But when you do this and you allow yourself to receive, you will receive in abundance and you'll receive an abundance. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. Hey, my pleasure. Let's flip the coin to leadership now. So we've really, and you've really honed it on sales. And I so appreciate you going through all that. Given that we've got, you know, the, and again, speaking from a network marketing standpoint, you know, we've got the gig economy, we've got the res great resignation. This is truly one of the greatest, if not the greatest times ever to be a network marketer, because so many people are looking for these side opportunities. But the caveat is we're bringing in a lot of folks who have been previous entrepreneurs, business owners, you know, real business minded people who need systems, you know, are used to having employees. And I'm leading up to the fact that how would you advise these people, these, these, you know, quote unquote, normal business people coming into network marketing and building a team and forming their leadership model? How would you advise them, excuse me, to work with the, the volunteer army? You know, these people aren't employees, you know, I hate to say it this way, you can't fire them, you can't yell at them, you know, you, you praise them and you hope they do the right thing. But when things go sideways and you're butting heads, how would you work as a leader to try and help these folks who have basically, you know, signed on, but aren't really employees to keep building in the right direction? Well, this, this all comes down to influence as well. Uh, you know, when you think about it on a very basic level, what is influence? Well defined, it's it's the ability to move a person or persons to a desired action, usually within the context of a specific goal. Now, mm -hmm. here's the difference, though. That might be the definition, but that's not its essence. The essence of influence is pull, pull as opposed to push, right? As in how far can you push a rope? Right. Not very, at least not very fast or very effectively, which is why great influencers, genuine influencers don't push. They don't push themselves. They don't push their ideas. They don't push their will on others. They're not push E. You never hear people say, wow, that Tom or that Mary, she is so influential. She has a lot of push with yeah. people. Yeah. No, she has, a, she's influential. She has a lot of pull with people. Mm -hmm. That's what influence is, right? It's pull. It's an attraction. Great influencers attract people to themselves and then to their ideas. So now the big question is how? Mm -hmm. And the way you do it first is understanding, uh, again, uh, to me, the most important element of human nature there is to understand. And it was explained in one sentence brilliantly by Dale Carnegie in his classic, How to Win Friends and Influence uh, People. And this okay. is where he wrote, yeah, this is where he wrote, ultimately, people do things for their reasons, not our reasons. Mm -hmm. So the genuine influencer knows this, and they ask themselves questions to make sure their focus is in the right direction. See, we need to be internally motivated, mm -hmm. but externally focused. Mm -hmm. So it's asking questions such as, how does, what I, how does what I want this other person to do, how does it align with their goals? with their needs, their wants, their desires, mm -hmm. with their values. Yeah. How does what I'm asking this other person to do, how does it align with you know, their problems that they want to solve or where they want to go, what they want to accomplish? Mm -hmm. And you know, when asking ourselves these questions thoughtfully, intelligently, uh, genuinely, authentically, not as a way to manipulate another human being into doing our will, but as a way of building everyone in the process, now we've come a lot closer to earning that person's commitment. Mm. We are in a very female dominated industry about, you know, 90% of network marketers are females. But again, given the point that I just made that we're seeing more transitioning professionals, you know, more, more men in general, just coming into the industry. Do you treat them differently? Do you speak to them differently? Because, you know, men are just intrinsically so differently driven than women. Do you see a big difference in the way that you provide your leadership to them? Or is it just the same thing? Doesn't matter if you're a man or woman, we all have the same brain and we're all, all trying to pull in the same direction. Well, I mean, I think if you ask different people, men and women both, you'll get a whole bunch of different answers. Okay. I mean, my feeling is people are people. And, and yeah, there's differences, of course, but there's differences in all different types of people, cultures, languages, this yeah. and that, but you know what? And I, and by the way, I think all differences need to be honored and respected. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I think when it comes right down to it, people are people and human nature is human nature. Mm -hmm. We all want to have control over our destinies. Yeah. 
right? We want to be to be excellent at something. We want to master something. We want to feel as though we're making a contribution to the world around us. We want to be able to have a, a, an amount of success that makes us feel as though uh, we're free and can do what we choose to do and can live life according to our own values. We want relationships with people that make us feel good about ourselves as we bring value to them. I think this is human nature. So yes, by all means, respect the, the differences and, and respect individuals as individuals while understanding there are certain kind of overarching elements of human nature. Yeah, no, that, that makes total sense. I, I got to know because, you know, given the time and given your, your, your years of training in sales and, and leadership, if you were to go back into the sales world today, if, if today was your first day in the sales world, no lists, nobody knew your name, you just were gonna, you know, you just joined, we'll call it network marketing just to make life easy on everybody, you just joined today, what would be the first couple of things that you would do? What, what would be, how, how would you crack the egg and get a new business started today in this weird new economy? Well, I mean, I, I probably determine, d d depending upon the, the product service and, and basic general ethos of the organization, mm -hmm. I would probably ask myself where I need to position myself to be around the people who I need to build relationships with that are either customers or referral sources. And then I'd begin the relationship building process. Yeah. Are you a big social media guy? Do you prefer belly to belly? What's what's always been your and again, I know that there's an evolution of the way things have gone, but you know, just you personally, is is that uh, do you lean more towards the digital end or are you more of a belly to belly? Well, guy? I don't think it's an either or. I think it's an and. Uh, I mean, I think all things being equal, if you can get belly to belly, that you always have a better opportunity to make a, a real human connection with someone. But that's not to say great connections and great relationships can't be built through social media. Gotcha. And I wanted to ask, uh, how can folks reach out to you? Because I, I know you've got so many different programs, so many books. I want to make sure that folks can reach out to you personally if they need the, if they need your help, if they want to hire you. So what is the best way to reach you if, if folks want to reach out for you? Thank you. Well, I, I'd say two websites. One is Berg, B-U-R-G dot com. That's kind of my speaking website, has my books and all those things. Mm -hmm. And then we also have the Go Giver online community. Mm. And that is the go giver without the hyphen, just the go giver community.com. Brilliant. I'll put that in the show notes for everybody because I want to make sure everybody can see that. We'll have all the information Thanks. about the books in, the, in your community. I love that. Thanks so much. Um, this is my favorite question to ask. And I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to ask you two because I want two versions of it. Uh, what okay. is your personal six month goal? Well, my personal um, six month goal has to do, and, and while I don't want to share exactly what the goal is, if, if that's okay, uh, it, it has to do with the, our membership community mm -hmm. and some of the programs that we're, that we're bringing to them. Wonderful. I love it. And it's, and, and you, you keep using that word community and it's just so, so important. Oh, thank you. Uh, oh my Lord. I mean, that's one of the reasons I was so excited to talk to you because you are the community based guy. Hey, and uh, now let's talk about an even bigger one. What's your six year goal? Well, Kathy Tajan, oh, my business partner and I um, are really doing two things. We, we, one of the things we have is a certified go-giver speaker program, or we have, it's a licensing program where people from all over the world license my basically 30 years of creation, creating programs, my yeah. uh, intellectual properties. And I always put a quote there, it's hard to think of myself as having intellectual properties. <laughs> as I do. Uh, so, so we continue to, to build that. And, uh, and then it's, it's taking the go-giver community to just a, a, a really, uh, you know, a really large level where we have just so many people. I mean, it's growing all the time, but of course in six years and, and, or 20 years or whatever, it's going to be even so much where we have just people who are connected with one another, who are all building their businesses, the go-giver way with a focus mm -hmm. on bringing immense value to others while having an openness to receiving in great abundance. Love it. One last tip for the network marketers that are looking to, that are watching today and feel like they're stuck. They, they just feel like they've got that glass ceiling. They can't break through it. I'd love to have just one last tip if you don't mind. I would say it's the advice I received about 40 years ago from, from a, a I, I call him a drive-by mentor because <laughs> I didn't really know the guy other than this one piece of advice, which I just happened to really need and he <laughs> happened to provide. Um, and, and what he said is if you wanna make a lot of money in business, in sales, what have you. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, don't have making money as your target. 
your target is serving others. When you hit the target, you'll get a reward and that reward will come in the form of money. But never forget, he said, the money is simply the reward for hitting the target. It's not the target itself. Your target is serving others others. And this is really where it hit me, I think, for the first time, that great salesmanship is never about the salesperson. You know, great salesmanship is never about the product, as important as that is. It's never what it's about. Mm -hmm. Great salesmanship is about the other person. It's about that person whose life you're attempting to add magnificent value to. And I guess we could say it's about that person whose life becomes better just because you are part of it. Ugh. And I think when we can approach it, our business that way, I think really that's where we're on the right track. And that's what keeps you going, right? I mean, that's that's the drive that gets you out of the bad days, the, you know, the right. staring at the ceiling at two o'clock in the morning with the, you know, stomach ache and the whole package, not knowing what you're going to do that next day is just being able to hang your hat on that philosophy, right? Yeah. Fantastic. Well, Bob Berg, thanks so much for being on today. I really appreciate it. You gave so much great advice and you and you actually gave scripting, <laughs> which, you know, everybody's just dying for. They want to know exactly what to say. But more importantly, you gave the, the strategies behind what the script does. And, and it's that's one of the things about this industry that we love is that when I can get an expert to talk to that actually says why we're using the scripting, it makes it so people learn how to fish and they're not just given a fish. So thanks again, Bob. I really appreciate you being on today. Oh, I appreciate you too. Thank you so much. Thanks, Bob. Have a great day.